Good morning, church. How are we all doing here in Elyria and out of the campuses? It's good to be with you. I'm Jason Russ. I'm the campus pastor for Lorraine, and it's so good to be together again today. I had an interesting morning um, coming in this morning. I had not had a chance to ride my motorcycle all week. You know, weather's kind of a weird thing and, and circumstances. So I was really looking forward to this morning, thinking last night and this morning as I looked on the weather app, I'm like, it can work. 15% chance of rain. I'm okay, okay? And even though it was ringing in my ears last night, my wife said, I don't think you want to ride your bike tomorrow. I would, I would drive, definitely. And I'm like, uh, we'll see, we'll see. And so I'm very hopeful. I got my gear on. I get my backpack on. I'm going to church early. I'm riding. I'm going in. And I'm going to, I'm doing this. It's going to be great. And so as I'm riding down, the, uh, down Broadway, big rain cloud comes over. Oh, my goodness. And of course, the last thing that was there for me to see as a sign was the sky, and the sky was foreboding. I mean, I just let's just say it. You know, I should have read the sky and known I shouldn't have gotten on that bike. But then here it comes. Boom. I just get a little sprinkle, but then I'm like, it's not that bad. I can make it. Dump after that. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm done. Time to turn around and what? Go home. And that's what I had to do. I had to go home. I had to shed the clothes, right? Because I'm like, I'm thinking I can't preach in this. I'm soaked. Like, my legs were all, all soaked. It's not going to dry in time. And I don't know about you, maybe that makes you feel better about the fact that we pastors, we leaders are human, right? Okay, I should have listened, right? I should have listened to the signs. And that's kind of how it is with our Christian lives though, isn't it? We, we should have listened to what God said. We should have listened to what we heard from his word. We should have listened to what my dear friend and my life group told me. We should have listened. But then it's time for me at some point to say, listen, okay, I got to turn around and get back home. And I need to shed those old clothes. I need to put on new ones. And I need to follow in the ways that Christ is calling to. Amen? And that's, that's kind of where I find myself a lot as we walk with the Lord. And, and this series has been so good to engage our minds. Uh, I've, been, I've found myself more thought, thoughtful during the week than I ever have been to ask myself the question, you know, what am I thinking? Uh, what am, what's going on in my head? And why am I making decisions the way I am? Why am I feeling the way I am right now? And I hope it's done that for you. Even last week, as I was listening to Pastor Brian preach, the word that came to mind for me as I was sitting there was the word home, 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 home. It was kind of hitting true. And a passage that, that, that came to mind was from the book of Matthew where Jesus was talking to a group of people and he simply said this about home. When an impure spirit, he says, comes out of a person, it goes through the arid places seeking rest and it does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. When, I, when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Of course, when it speaks of house here, what's it talking about? A human person, a body. And it says then, it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and it goes and it lives there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And he says, that is how it will be with this wicked generation. Now, you got to understand the context of this is Jesus is talking to religious people. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to people who are the ones that are the bearers of the law, the, one that, the ones that do all the, the churchy type stuff that we would call that today. And he's saying this to them because in that moment, they had the audacity to say to Jesus, it's by the power of Satan that you are casting out demons, that you are healing people. And Jesus was saying, are you kidding me? No way. This house this house is for the Spirit of God. You do not tell the Spirit of God that it's the Spirit of Satan. That's blasphemy, and that's unforgivable, and that's why Jesus got so fired up at him. But I, it made me think of the fact that, you know, I want to remind you from Ephesians 2 that we are the household of God. Paul said that. We, church, we are his house that's being built up, right? Jesus the cornerstone, and we're being built up brick by brick as a temple for the Spirit of God. But he also says that the, the truth is that we, each of us individually, are a house for God. And so we are no longer, he says, citizens, strangers, aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. And so uh, Pastor Jim initiated this series and he got us going on this housekeeping as we've been thinking about, you know, our minds really are kind of like the front door to our body, aren't they? If, uh, if, if, as, as, our, as we think is, is the way that we are. And so we've been doing this housekeeping, thinking uh, about what we think and all that that goes on there. And as I think of this keeping, Isaiah said this, I think it's so 
key for us. You will keep us, keep that one in perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. God is the one that really keeps the house for us as we look to him, what his son has done for us, as we look to Christ, and then we are kept in peace. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And, and, and Isaiah reminds us of that today. And Jim really got us going in the first part of this, uh, talking about then, what are we thinking? What, what we think matters. We, we can't say that we're of the way of Christ, that we're of the house of the Lord, and yet we think like a godless person. That can't be, folks. Then Pastor John took us to the next passage talking about house guests. And this really stuck with me about the fact that when we, when we um, harbor in our hearts uh, anger and unforgiveness for the people around us, uh, for anyone, then if that's living there, guess what? It opens up a guest room to the devil. That foothold creates a guest room to the devil. And I don't know about you, but that scared me to death as I thought about the rooms of the house that, that are shut off in my life and saying, no, I don't want any, any room for the enemy in my life. Absolutely not. And then last week we did some house purging, didn't we? Pastor J- uh, Brian gave us a, a wonderful picture of basically walking into the, the walk-in closets or the, the wardrobes of our house and, and, and looking over and saying, man, this is all the clothes of the old ways. I need to purge it. I need to get it out of here, put it out. And I need to put on the new clothing that I've been given in Christ. So how's it been going? Do you have your list somewhere in your journal? Did you finish out that listing of what you're putting off and what you're putting on? I did. I hope you are too. And, and if you haven't, can I just encourage you that, that getting in community, being in a life group, that's what life groups are for, is to sit down after a sermon and say, okay, we had a list we were supposed to finish. Let's finish it together right now. Let's talk about it. Let's pray for each other on that list. You know what I'm saying? And you can do that in a discipleship group, a dig as well. But that's so important for us to to apply what we are hearing in the word. But today, as we get to the last two verses of this section, we're going to be doing some more house cleaning. It feels like a lot of work. It feels like we are just going away. But can I say that it's actually more than house cleaning? It's actually deep cleaning. Now, I was talked to after the service about, uh, from someone in the first hour that said that they love to deep clean, right? Uh, some of you out there love to deep clean. I'm sorry that you're, you're built that way, but you know, that's, that's not everybody, okay? That's not me, certainly. But most people, I think, when it comes to deep cleaning, it's like the last thing on the list. We can't quite get to it because there's other things to do, right? But God bless you, that those of you that, that love to deep clean. Maybe you can teach me some things, especially today, as we talk about this, because that's where Paul goes. The last two verses are reserved for him saying, you know, we're going to go to that room in the house that nobody wants to go to and just forgets about. When I was, when I was growing up, I grew up in this church and we came here a lot. As a matter of fact, it was very rare that my father, who taught at the school and he also ministered at the church, uh, that we would ever get home uh, and dad would already be home. But it, it did happen every now and then. When my brother, my brother and I, he's three years older than me, and I had a five-year uh, younger sister. Uh, and when Scott and I and April would get home with mom and dad's car was there, we, we knew one thing was true. Well, dad's home. But then we saw that the, all the lights in the house were off. And then we knew there was definitely something afoot. Dad is somewhere in that house, and we got to find him. So we go in. My sister would stay out because she's too scared. My brother Scott and I would go in and Flip all the lights on in all the rooms. Then we go to the closets, all the lights on in the closets. Look under the beds. No, Dad. That only meant one thing. It's a ranch house. He's in the basement. No, not the basement. Okay, so Scott and I then would get to the basement stairs. We would jockey for position. And then you know how you get to a basement and you flip the light on and it's not much help because all it looks like is this. It just lights up the top of the stairs. Now, I got to say, one caveat, this is not my parents' basement, okay? But... To me and my brother, when we knew he was down there somewhere, this is what it looked like. Scary and dark and cracked walls, right? Things crawling up the stairs at you. So, of course, as my brother would often do, we would head down and I'd say, you go. No, you go, you go, you go. And then he'd push me down the stairs first as the younger one. And then I'd get to the bottom of the stairs and my brother would be coming down. And guess where dad was? I bet you could probably guess. He was actually under the stairs. And these are the kind of slat stairs where you could put your hand through. So my brother would get down halfway through and then my dad 
would make him pay and grab him by the ankle and, and my brother would fall. I'd zip up the stairs to safety and, and all would be well. My brother got his just due for pushing me down the stairs first, right? But that was one ex example. But there was another time too that when I think of the basement, when I thought of a, a time I snuck up on my dad, and actually was not a happy moment in our lives because we had found out from dear friends that uh, a young gal, a teenager, had taken her own life that was connected to our family. And so uh, I didn't know the gravity of it. I was a kid, but I couldn't find my dad. It was a day, probably a Saturday, we're home or a Sunday, and I'm, I'm looking for him. And I go and I snuck down to the basement, and there was my dad sitting on the other side of the basement uh, by a workbench, and he was just crying. And that was not something I ever saw my dad do much. That was the one time, I think, in my young life. And I was, I was broken by it. I couldn't help him. I snuck back out. He didn't even know I was there. He might be hearing the, this for the first time, actually. Uh, but it, it just broke my heart. But you know what? That's, that's the basement. It's the place where we go that we can kind of get away, hide maybe, right? We can maybe even cry out to God alone. It's a place where, where I don't know, what, what comes to your mind, you know? There's even finished basements. Some of you have those man caves. Still, it's a place to kind of get away, to hide. Uh, for some of us, maybe even the Midwest, uh, the good thing about a basement is it's a place of safety if there's a tornado, right? Uh, but for some of you, cracks and leaks, it just stinks and you don't like basements. So whatever it is that comes to mind, I think Paul throws it into this last couple of verses of the section to get us engaged in our minds, our thinking about what we are to do. What are we thinking when it comes to the home that is our life? And so let's get on our feet. Let's get our Bibles out. Let's go to Ephesians 4 and let's finish this out. We'll do it in the NIV. And uh, Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. And let's read this together. Get rid, Paul says, of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, and he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I love how it puts this in the NLT. We're going to use the, the New Living just because a few of the words, I think, are a bit closer to uh, more common language that we would use. So here it is. Uh, get rid. Let's, let's deal with the first one. This is the one that's, that's definitely the deep cleaning verse of this whole thing. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words instead of brawling, and slander, as well as, instead of malice, he said in the NLT, all types of evil behavior. So, so what are we looking at here, folks? We're looking at more putting off, like Brian talked about last week, but we're doing a, a getting rid. Like, this isn't just putting off in a corner. This is like, get it out, burn it, get rid of it, never to re return to it again. Get rid of how much of it? All of it, okay? And, and, and here's the list. Bitterness is the first one. Bitterness. This is a, a, another word for bitterness is resentment. Uh, you, can, you can definitely see that in relationships, whether it's a friend or especially if it's marriage, if resentment, bitterness creep into that relationship, it's, it's a killer. Uh, and and the, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Check it out when he says this about bitterness. See to it that no one falls short of the grace in the, of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Wow. Have you ever thought about that fact, that, that bitterness is like a plant that if you can chop it off, no matter how many times you get the, the, the holy weed whacker and you knock that bugger off, if you don't get it down in the roots, it's going to come right back up. And there's two things that will happen when bitterness lives in you. It's going to cause trouble. Can I get an Amen. <laughs> Yeah, we've seen it in our own lives, haven't we? And it doesn't just stay with you. It says it defiles, it corrupts many. So we need to take it seriously when we're talking deep cleaning. Bitterness is a killer and bitterness defiles other people around you. It does not just stay with you, no matter how many times we want to say it does. The next one, rage and anger. Pastor John talked to a lot of us, uh, to us so well about anger uh, but then Paul throws in here rage, which is, you know, in, in anger, you can s sort of have your, your mental facilities and you can 
righteously, you know, dole out anger and still have your mind. Rage is like beyond that, where your, your thinking gets disconnected, and now it's just you're doing things and saying things you're going to have to say you're sorry for later, and it's totally disconnected from thinking about consequences. That's rage, out of control, wrath that, that is, is uh, damaging. And so then on top of that, harsh words, brawling, it might say in some of your uh, texts, but it's, it's that idea when, when we hear harsh words that, that don't uh, connect with what's normal. For example, when you're in a restaurant, we've been there, right? We're all at the restaurant, music's playing nice and lightly enough that you can have nice conversation. You're sitting there with your friends, everybody's around. And then someone in the kitchen drops a huge platter on the ground that goes and shatters. Ever had that happen? What happens? Everybody in the restaurant together goes boom, like that. We all jump, everybody looks at the kitchen. It's like you were, you don't have to train for it. It just happens. It's jarring. And everybody's like, whoa, what, did, what just happened? That's exactly what it is. That's the de- depiction of this word, harsh words. What happens in the soul of everybody that hears it, that's the idea. And then, and then the next one, again, this is a deeper one, slander. Uh, we understand this to be when, when you are saying something that is untrue about a person, not to their face, but to everybody else that you can. And, and that's, that's a really difficult one. The, the text, as you look at the word in Greek, it's, it's the word we, we use for blasphemy. So when you are saying something untrue about someone else, it's blasphemy about that person, which is why, again, Jesus got so worked up at those religious leaders. He got defensive of the Holy Spirit that was in him and said, that's blasphemy, that's slander against the Holy Spirit. How dare you say that I'm casting out by the power of Satan? But we do that with each other. It's even in a list that Jesus gave. Take a look at what Jesus said in Matthew 15. For out of the heart, he says, look at this. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts. This is where Jesus connects the heart and our thoughts and our thinking. Out of our heart comes these evil thoughts. Things like murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Notice Jesus says that starts in the heart. And these are what defile a person. So Jesus is making a very big point to us that we're defiled when those things are within us, okay? And so that's why then they, they, they begin within us and then Paul puts out there any evil behavior, malice. That's what malice is, is, is all kinds of evil behavior. Any kind of wickedness is what we need to get rid of. All this, get rid of all of it. Because all this, it starts inside, that defiles us, but then it comes out in evil behavior, and that's our problem. Now, you might be thinking that, oh, you know, Paul just likes to rant and rave about this in his letters, and it's not the other apostles. How about, let's take a look at James. The apostle James says, therefore, get rid, same language, of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent, and humbly accept the word that's been planted in you. Why? Because that word can save you. Just like we sang about, He saves us. The word saves us from ourselves. And then Peter, let's just throw Peter in there. The rock said this, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Okay, so so he's in a chorus. Paul's in a chorus of with the apostles saying that this is something we've got to do. We've got to deep clean. We've got to go to the basement, church. Uh, and we got to do it as a body, and we got to keep each other encouraged and accountable, and we've got to do it. It starts with each one of us looking at our own house and what God's doing. And you might say, why the fuss? Why now? I mean, who, who likes to do this, you know? I mean, why do this? It's, it's just too much. Well, you know, some of you ask that same question when you're looking at your basements filled with memorabilia and different things from your family in years gone by, and I've heard my mom say this, that, that she's like, man, I, I just, I need to do something about my basement. And why does she care about it so much? Because if she doesn't deal with it, then guess what's happening? It's going on to the next generation. When she goes to heaven, then the next generation is going to have to deal with that basement, that attic, wherever, right? And that's the way it is in our spiritual life, in our, in our walk with Jesus, in our character life. If we don't deal with it, we don't shine the light of God's truth on that basement, on those deep, dark areas of our life. And if we just ignore it, then guess what? Who's going to get the brunt of it? It's going to be the generation after us and the generation after us. And that's a root of a lot of our generational sins that go after us is we don't deal with it. We don't 
grab the hand of the Spirit of God and say, let's go do some deep cleaning, Lord. Help me with these areas of my life. That's why it matters. But there's a bigger reason why it matters. When you look at that list, when you look at that list that Paul gives us, it's a list of character traits. Character traits that, re, that not resemble, but they identify someone who's at work in this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. His name is Satan, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And why does he do that? Why does he do all those evil things? Because he is full of bitterness towards our creator. He is full of rage against God. Nothing but harsh words and slander come out of his mouth about God. Look at the the. Genesis chapter three, as as Eve talks to Satan, the serpent, he's slandering God right there at the beginning of the book. And you see that he is full of all kinds of evil behavior all through history as he infiltrates this world and people against the God of heaven, against our creator, against his creator. You see, these are traits of Satan. And so I wanna just tell you something today, church. We are either a house of the Lord or we are a house of the enemy. There are no other houses. There is a house of the Lord or a house of the enemy. The question is, what fills you? You know, when Jesus talked to those people and spoke of the example of the house that's been put in order and cleaned up, he was talking about men that that used the law to clean up their life and make it look pretty, but it was not filled with anything. And that's why those demons could come and right back in. So are you filled with the Lord or are you a house of the enemy? You know, look at the enemy's track record. I want to show you from the Old Testament. Isaiah said this about Satan. You said, Satan, to yourself, I will ascend to heaven, set my throne above God's stars. I'll preside on the mountain of the gods far away from the north of the north, in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the Most High. Do you see where these, where is this text coming from? It's coming from the the mind, the thoughts of Satan. He was saying these things in his heart. And that's where it began. The sin of Satan began in his thinking, and then his actions, his evil behavior came out when he defied God. Ezekiel records this about Satan. Your heart was filled with pride because of your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. Wow. Does that sound kind of like the day and age we live in, our culture today, in American culture? Absolutely. Filled with pride. We uh, care so much about our appearance and our beauty that it corrupts our, our minds because of our love of splendor. And our mind and our heart are corrupted. That's Satan. It started in his heart and his mind, and it came out in his behavior. And that's something for us to pause on because Solomon adds to this in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We got to deal with the depth of the basement of our hearts, of that area of our house that we don't want to deal with. What is going on in here versus what's going on and what I'm presenting to everyone out there. We got to deal with it, folks. Because if you look up Proverbs uh, 23 right here, it is a man who's saying, come eat. Come and eat the food I prepared for you, Gene. I've I've made food for you here. But in my heart, I'm saying, man, I hate Gene. I can't stand him. I'm, I, I'm, I gave him the worst of the stuff I found in the cupboards. And soon enough, how he really feels inside is going to be known to Gene. It's going to make him sick to his stomach. He won't want to eat the food anymore. That's what this verse is talking about. Getting to the depths of our heart and, and saying, oh, I need to stop with this, uh, this false front when the, the heart doesn't match my actions. God wants to bring those together. That's the motive of the deep cleaning here. So as we think about this and, and we, we want to see God to rid this in our lives, you know, unfortunately, it's that, that dichotomy uh, between what's going on in here and what's going on in the outside that drives people away from the church. Have you noticed this? Many people, and maybe at a point in your life that was you, you ran from the church, you didn't want to be a part of it because... Uh, there was just too many hypocrites and people love to throw that out there. And, and yet there is some truth to that for sure. But can I say to you, can I say to you, the word of God, the spirit of God, what Christ has done for us does not let us off the hook. He's calling you back. The best place for you to be to overcome that hypocrisy in your own house is to pursue the Lord in community. 
to, to go beyond Sunday morning and to do more than just come to church. Spiritual growth is, is going to be stunted if that's all you ever do is come to your campus and then go home. I want to challenge you on that because there was a young lady named Kathy in our church many years ago. She came and she came with her kids alone because she knew. You talk about being beat up by life and by the world around her. She, was, she felt alone. She loved her husband. Her, loved, her husband loved her, but both of them knew they were missing something. So she started coming. And the refuge moment of her week was taking her kids to kids ministry and then going to her class of uh, uh, adults like her. And she was single, and, and not single, but she was married, but her husband didn't want anything to do with the church. And so soon enough, God blessed her, brought the word to her, she came to Christ. And then that class, which became a, a home group, which then became a life group, they stuck together for a long time, began to pray for Don, pray and lift up Don to the Lord. And miraculously, years later, Don came to know Christ, sitting in his truck in a rainstorm, waiting for the rain to let up so he could do work. And God just showed up and he said, I give up. I'm yours, Lord. And from that point on, these guys went on a journey of not just coming to church, but getting involved in church, being a part of life groups along the way. More recently, they came to Lorraine when we opened up the campus and they've been involved helping us in kids ministry. But in January, they jumped in and started and, and were part of a new life group. So I want Don to tell a little bit of that piece of that story of what God did recently in this new life group. Before life groups were life groups, we had a group of friends that just went and studied and that's what really got me realizing, you know, what what it was to have other people, you know, supporting you. And when I got sick, uh, just laying there knowing I couldn't go anywhere or do anything. But I ended up in the hospital for eight days. She dropped me off in the parking lot and that was it. I just laid there and uh, kept getting worse. And on Sunday, my daughter Macy called me and <clears throat> told me that the whole church prayed for me. And I can't tell you the feeling that I got. They sent an infectious disease doctor in and she talked to me and she says, well, you're not getting any better. It's not in your lungs yet. It's all in your upper respiratory but we're gonna to have to give you a remesivir and it was a five day IV of remesivir. Next morning I beeped the buzzer to go to the bathroom and when I stood up, I was like, wow. I mean, this is just, they gave it to me at nine o'clock at night. And uh, then I went to the bathroom and when I came out, I asked the nurse if I could sit in a chair. Next day was better and better. And uh, the whole time I could watch everybody on my phone, getting a hold of Kathy on the group thing from Life Group and our past Life Group from Elyria, and it was just like knowing, having all those people on your side. Can't even explain it. <laughs> I mean, for me, the biggest thing was just when that happened to me, having that support and uh, knowing that there was someone in there to help her if she needed it. Uh, <clears throat> I think everybody needs to be in a life group, but you need people there to support you. And it's just like having your family there. So I've got on the screen here uh, a link for you to just go check it out. We want to help you get connected into life groups uh, because in Don's case, it was a physical struggle of his physical life, his physical house. That was the moment that God just blessed him in his life group helping him. And it was, you know, years of being in a life group, right, of different life groups and God using those people. 
Uh, but, you know, we're going, we go through all kinds of struggles, spiritual struggles, mental, emotional. We need each other, folks. And so I hope you'll check that link out today and, and be a part of a group. If that's not for you and you'd rather just talk to someone, talk to one of your campus team folks, talk to your campus pastor. We want to get you connected. Um, and, and so there is a better way. I think that's what, that what, is what Paul is getting to here. And that's why the next verse begins with uh, the word instead. He's saying, get rid of all this stuff. Okay, get rid of all of it in, in your house, but instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So if you're taking notes, let's write this down. And This is all towards one another. This is the context, relationships, all towards one another. Instead, we are to be something. Instead of all that other stuff, we are to be kind, first of all. Kindness is the opposite of evil. We often think good and evil, but kindness means goodness, right? So kindness is the expression of goodness. It is, it is what we do to combat evil. And, and that is what we need to remember. Tenderheartedness, again, being tenderhearted is what we're to be. Uh, being easily moved to love, to, to sorrow, to empathy, uh, to, to go after someone in, in, with your heart and tender to what they're going through. And finally, forgiving, Paul says, we need to be forgiving, and the, the root of this in the, in the Greek is, is the word we get for, for grace. We need to be ready to give grace, ready to be gracious in how much love and forgiveness we give. Uh, and what's the motivation? Why? Why do we do all this? What's, what's motivating us to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving instead of all the other old ways? Well, it's this. God's kindness, God's tenderheartedness, God's forgiveness that has been shown to us. And you might say to yourself today, well, no, I don't know. I don't know this God you talk about. I've never experienced his kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiving uh, attitude. Well, you, well, I'm telling you today, it came to us through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God it says, so love the world that he gave his only son, or earlier in the book, Paul said that, that it's, not, it's by grace you've been saved, through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, Jesus Christ, your Lord, who's been given to you. He is our gift. So none of us can brag that we've got anything. It's all a gift from God. He's given us Jesus Christ. And because he's done all this, that's our motivation. Now, if you're anything like me, though, sometimes I, I may have motivation up here, but I lack the power, when, especially when it comes to the deep cleaning, when it, it, it comes to a, you know, a long day of work and I got to do this work, what's the power? How do we get that power? Well, the power comes by us filling our minds with truth, like we've been talking about, filling our minds with the truth about what he's done for us. And as we look at this text we've been looking at, we see that the truth I want you to hear this morning is that we have a father in heaven who loves us, who reached down and said, I'm not going to just let you implode and, and destroy each other, but I love you, and I'm going to send my son. We have a father and a son, and there is a spirit that's at work here as well. If you go back one verse in verse 30, it says this, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Have you ever thought about the fact that we, we bring sorrow to him? Remember, he has identified you as his own. You are sealed. You're guaranteed that you will be saved on the day of redemption. I'm reminding you what we've already heard in this book. What's the seal? That's, it's the Holy Spirit in us. So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we need to understand that God's Spirit fills us. And so we don't want to grieve him by throwing muck and things around. It's, it's this beautiful thing of, of the, the Spirit is giving us the power to be everything that God desires us to be. Uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all initiating and loving and giving and guiding and empowering us. And so after I come to a place where I become a believer and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I, I say, I want to follow you, I want to live for you, you know, it's like this, that I think we often, as believers, we think of ourselves as the person we used to be. And so, for example, a, a message like this, I'm telling you, go to the basement, you know, start having the Holy Spirit help you, clean up the muck, the the bad language, the, the, the slander, the different things that clean it up. And you expect, and you and I would expect, I'm looking at the floor and what I'm seeing, and I'm expecting to see that old cracked floor. But what I find is I find a, a perfect floor, perfectly painted, and it's gorgeous. And then I go to the walls upstairs and I start cleaning the walls and I see, I expect 
the holes and the stuff and the plaster I remembered in my old life. And, and guess what? They're, they're patched up. They're perfect. And I look at the lighting fixtures that were ripped down and I, I'm thinking, this is, this is who I am, right? No, and you look and there's lighting fixtures that are beautiful and chandeliers and, and it's a, the house, the inside of the house. I've been reborn. I've been remade. The house is brand new. But what have I been doing? I've been throwing muck and all this junk all over it. And God's loving spirit comes alongside us and says, yes, remember who you are. Don't, let me help you clean it up so you can remember that I have made you new. You are reborn. You are mine. You belong to me. But how do we go about this? Just in this filling our mind with truth, let me suggest this. Fill your mind with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. It's all about him. Fill your mind with Jesus. Remember, he's the one that said, I, am, I and the Father are one. And I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send the spirit of truth. And that's how the Father and I will make our home in you. Okay, I'm, I'm putting together a few different verses, but that's exactly it. The Father and the Son are at home in the believer through the spirit. And so if we fill our mind with Jesus, and if he fills me completely, then I must fill my mind with all of him continually. Because again, back to what Jesus was saying to those religious leaders, you see, when, when we are full of the Spirit, when we are full of Jesus, and there's, there's no room for Satan to have a guest room. There's no room for Satan to do anything but throw things at us. Uh, but that's cool because we got the shield of faith and we got the sword of the Spirit. And so we can just knock those down, those arrows down. Because Satan has no room because our minds are continually filled with Jesus. I was talking to a friend from the Lorraine campus this week who, who told me she was so overjoyed because she was reading the word, and realize on her Bible app that she can actually tap that little icon that has um, a microphone, and the, and the Bible will read it read to you auditorily, right? And so I discovered that a while ago with mine, and I love it, because if I'm on a bike ride or if I'm on a walk or whatever, walking my dogs, I'll put my earphones in, and I'm just going to listen to my devotions today. Instead of reading them, I'm going to hear them, and I'm going to listen to them over and over again as I'm walking or running. And this gal was just so excited. She has a 30-minute commute, and, and she's been doing it all week, listening to the Word. Fill your mind with Jesus, folks. There's so many ways to do that now, and I, I love it because it's, it's the way that we can do that. So what are some other ways that we can do this? Applications. At the bottom of your page, you, you'll see every week we have the core Christ-like characteristics down there for you, which is basically the C-H-R-I-S-T, the characteristics of Christ that are in this text that you can... Uh, focus on that week, okay? We usually don't have you fill in the blanks, but I'm doing it this week because I want you to see how to practically apply what we're talking about today. How can we do the deep cleaning in our lives, in our houses, folks? Connect yourself to God through the word and prayer this week. Just like I mentioned, my friend, listening to the word or reading the word. Life groups, again, is a great place for you to, to tap into that. Um, you can get connected to the word by this uh, seminars like, like Clay's doing over uh, later, later on, you can sign up. We talked about that earlier. Uh, for example, another way you can do that is to get out in nature and connect with God. Pastor Jim is doing another one of those off-road discipleships this Saturday out at the Castelia Quarries. You can sign up for that on the Connect Center, okay? But we, we, we try to think of ways that the daily devotions, all these different ways, we're doing this, we're throwing this all at you to say, here's ways that you can do this, connect to God, and get, get yourself focused on Jesus. The, the R, we see this in the message today in the text, relating to others with, with love, other-centered love. That's how Jesus acted. That's how Jesus lived. That's how we need to live. And again, like I said, life groups, that's a great place for you to relate with other-centered love in people's lives, right? So that's one way. I want to encourage you to think about your neighbors, to think about ways that you can Love on and encourage your neighbors and love on them. I was telling the last hour that even grabbing your life groups and going and doing something fun like this Saturday uh, is going to be at the Lorain County Speedway. It's open door day. And we're having a, um, there they're going to have monster trucks. And anybody from open door that says I'm with open door, you get in free. All right. So what a great opportunity for life groups to go, for you to bring your neighbors and friends and to come and be with the community and with the family of God. It doesn't always have to be, you know, sitting in a room studying the Bible. We can get together and have fun, and we can love on each other and bring in our neighbors and friends, okay? And the last thing I want you to, do, to see in this text is the S, 
spirit-led servant. How can we go deeper in the Lord in cleaning out the house that is our own hearts and our lives is that we're in the word and prayer? And how can we love others like Jesus did? Only through the spirit leading us. Only through him making us the servant of all like Jesus talked about. And so I wanna just encourage you that we do this and our house is continually occupied with the Savior. It, it basically drives away the enemy. And so I want you to see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. He says that when we think about the Spirit's involvement in our life, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For, he quotes Isaiah, who has the mind, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? I mean, who in the world could even know the mind of God as we're talking about what are you thinking? Who could know that? Listen, Paul says this, but we have the mind of Christ. Do you understand what he's saying there? That we, believer, church, we have the mind of Christ because the Spirit of God lives in our house. So we can have hope. We can be encouraged. We can understand that, that we can do this. And in light of this passage today, in light of the mind of Christ, I want to take you into the, the thinking of Jesus. As we head to the table, we're going to do communion here in a minute in all our campuses. I want to climb into the mind of Jesus. What, what was often on Jesus' mind when he was teaching, when he was talking to people about his Father? Well, let's start with the Lord's Prayer. We all know the Lord's Prayer, mostly. Uh, if you've ever been in church, uh, you, you know the Lord's Prayer. Well, what's right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer? Right dead, dead in the middle of it is, forgive us our sins in the same way that we forgive those who sin against us. And in case that goes by real fast and you don't think about it, if you look in, it's, that comes from Matthew 6. If you look in Matthew 6, this is what Jesus says immediately after he teaches the prayer. He says, For if, you don't, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whoa, it's kind of harsh, Jesus. Was he serious? Well, let's, let's ask Mark. Mark 11, Jesus said this, I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. A lot of TV preachers love this one, right? Name it, claim it. We love that one. But the next verse says this, when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. I'm beginning to see a theme here. Jesus sees the way that I forgive others connected to the way the Father's gonna for forgive me. Holy cow. Not done yet, Luke 17. Watch yourselves, Jesus says. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord appropriately, show us how to increase our faith. <laughs> how do we forgive like that? Another text, Jesus even said 70 times seven, which is basically infinite. Forgive, forgive, forgive. And make sure we don't miss the point, Matthew 18, Jesus tells this amazing story about a king who has people that owe him money. He gets the guy that owes him the most. This guy owes him like two lifetimes wages. And this guy comes and begs for mercy. And the king gives him mercy, forgives the whole debt, sends him out. That guy goes out, finds Dwight, his buddy, and Dwight owes him two bucks. And he beats up Dwight and he sends him to prison because he can't pay. He finds out about it. And then the king finds out about it. He drags that servant in front of him and he says this. He says, I forgave you that tremendous debt. I forgave you because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had with you? That's a question for every one of us. As we approach the table this morning, shouldn't you have had mercy on that person? Fill in the blank because I had such great mercy on you. Listen to what it says next. Then the angry king sent the man to the prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Jesus isn't talking about, I'm sorry, like my kids do. I'm sorry. No, that's disconnected from the heart. 
I want to see you forgive from your heart. Jesus cares about deep cleaning in our lives, folks. He wants us to forgive that way. Can I just say, some people in that sound of my voice, you are feeling tortured right now. You are living a tortured life because you've never come to Jesus, to God, and said, forgive me. Forgive my debt. I receive what Jesus did for me. I accept him as my savior. I believe in what he did for me on the cross. Forgive my sins. And if you've never done that today, you can do that right now. Just right in your seat. Say, I, I believe. I accept you, Jesus. Be my Lord. And he will relieve you of all the debt, just like that king. And some of you believers are living tortured lives because where you sit right now, you have said to the spirit, you've said to God, no, I cannot forgive that. No, I will not go there. I will not go to the basement. I will not deep clean. No way. Absolutely not. And your resistance, it's eating at your soul. But you know what? God loves us so much. He sees you. He sees where you're hiding. He's, he knows right where you are in the house. And he finds you and he loves you and he's reaching you and he's showering his love and his, his unconditional mercy upon you in Christ. And he's not done with you. Open up to him, believer. Open up, give up. Give it to him. And so I want to encourage you right now as we head to communion in our campuses, evaluate your house. Evaluate the house that is your life before you join this house in the act of remembering what Christ has done for us. Because, you know, communion is a time for us believers to come together and to think. What am I thinking? What a, the, the, the table reminds us of the great love of God for us shown in Christ. It should change us every month when we do it so that we confess and we come to the Lord and we go and make things right with people and then we go out and we shout for joy. Joy because of what God's done. This house is filled with the Lord. So therefore I have joy. I can't hold it back. And so I encourage you to do that today as I pray over you as we head into communion. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness to us. Would you apply this word to our hearts? Be with us as we come into a time of communion to, to, to look at the body and the blood and to say, Lord, this is my house that's not my own and, and I give it to you. Be with those that don't know you, Jesus, that, that they would surrender to you and come in faith to you and say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm, I accept you for what you've done for me. And be with believers right now that are holding on to anger, to some of these things clothes of the past, and may they shed everything, Lord. Get rid of it and accept the word that's been planted in them today. Be with us as we continue as one, as one church to remember what you've done for us, God, through Christ. We thank you. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.